Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Paranormal Pets. I am your host, Brandy Stark. And we are doing our fourth installation of Werewolves of Winter. At the end of this particular episode, we will also do a little bit of a segment from a paranormal investigation that the Spirits of St. Petersburg did that actually did involve animals, though they were not of the paranormal kind. Sometimes not everything on an investigation is haunted, but this was kind of a funnier episode, so I thought we might include it just to give listeners something a little different. Anyway, we're going to get started with all of that right after these messages. Pets are part of the family. Make sure you can always afford the quality health care they need with Easy Pet Check, a nationwide pet insurance alternative. With Easy Pet Check, you'll save up to 75% on all your pet's health care at any licensed veterinarian in the U.S. Easy Pet Check accepts all dogs and cats regardless of pre-existing conditions. Visit EasyPetCheck.com. That's the letters EasyPetCheck.com. Taking care of your pet can be easy with Easy Pet Check. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. And welcome back. The pugs are already asleep, so if you hear any background noise, I apologize. The pugs have gone to bed, and my pocket pets, my rats, are all awake. So I think the household at any given time, there's somebody, there's some denizen here that's doing something. So anyway, we'll see how this goes. Uh, Just a brief prediction for 2021. My hunch is this. I think the first two to three months are going to be a definite extension of 2020. I think it's going to be a bumpy start. I suspect that things will slowly even out over the first six to eight months of 2021. But by that fourth quarter, I'm really hoping that we see a nice turnaround and some progression into a much more positive direction than what we have been dealing with for the past year. I'm telling you, it has been, uh, it's been crazy, but we'll see if I'm right. Ask me this time next year, right? Anyhow, we are talking a little bit about transformative animals or people transforming into animals. And I think it's a a very fascinating concept because it does deal with the very thin line between the animal world and the human world. Humans usually set themselves aside from the animals, particularly in the West, by claiming animals either don't have souls or were not specially created with consciousness and a an ability of communication in the sense of language. And I think the werewolf or the were animal stories in general maybe tie us back a little bit. Uh, maybe we're not as different as we think, or perhaps humanity clings so desperately to those two elements, this uh, consciousness between right and wrong and the ability to utilize language to discuss complicated topics that we're afraid to lose them. I mean, there's really only how much that keeps us separated from the animal world. So I think the were creatures are kind of an interesting psychological element here. And of course, this particular book that uh, we are engaged in, again, the book on werewolves by Dr. Bob Curran, is quite intriguing in that respect. He covers a lot of kind of obscure mythology and uh, obscure ideas, and I think uh, it's kind of fun. So I will tell you that if you happen to be in the St. Petersburg area, once I pretty much finish with this episode, I do plan to put my copy, which was uh, given to me, in the Little Free Library of Supernatural Stuff, which is located uh, right outside my studio in downtown St. Petersburg. So we actually have a paranormal little library, if you will, right outside of Art Loft. So if you're ever in St. Petersburg, please feel free to check it out. It is located at 10 Fifth Street North by the Fifth Street entrance of downtown St. Petersburg. So kind of a cool thing. So we're going to start off 
In part, I thought this would be a good little segue because it's very topical. Over the Christmas break, essentially, on uh, Christmas Day, I did actually purchase a $14.99 subscription for a month to HBO Max, which, ironically, I'm not even getting paid to say this, but I have been greatly enjoying their streaming channel and (laughs) thinking about keeping it. I've been enjoying it that much, but we'll see. I've got about four weeks or three and a half weeks left to kind of evaluate, but I did get it in order to see Wonder Woman 1984. And that particular movie deals with a character called the Cheetah. They actually do not name her in the movie. And my overall critique of the movie is that it was probably a solid C. I don't know. I, it was a very mixed bag. I've seen a lot of very mixed reviews. But the Cheetah character in this movie was not heavily emphasized for the way she became the Cheetah. So in case you aren't aware, my Third thesis, second second thesis, okay, so my second thesis was actually on comic books, and I've been a comic book, of, <laughs> I've just, I've read them since the 1980s, I am one of the 10% of female readership that started out back in the day, I'm on and off with them right now because they've really mainstreamed and become popular culture, and I don't know, I whenever things become popular, it's just boring after that, you know? But I actually did write my second thesis on the role of superheroines in comic books. Interestingly enough, I did devote about a third of that paper to Wonder Woman, in part because I took Mary Marvel, Wonder Woman, and uh, The Invisible Girl, which are three of the earliest superheroines, one from... um, Fawcett Comics, which eventually gets looped into DC Comics, Wonder Woman for DC, and Invisible Girl for Marvel. And I actually did kind of a comparison of the three and likened them to archetypes. So we have the maiden, the virginal warrior, and the mother slash wife and career woman, interestingly enough. But the Wonder Woman mythos to me is quite fascinating because, of course, Wonder Woman starts off as an Amazon and one of her arch enemies is the cheetah. By the time we hit really the more modern era of Wonder Woman comic books, the cheetah actually goes into an obscure culture where she undergoes a magical ritual that imbues her with the power of the cheetah. It literally turns her into a were cheetah. So Barbara Minerva literally becomes the cheetah and gains attributes of both human understanding and control along with the cheetah's super speed and animalistic abilities. And I thought that was kind of interesting and I've not followed this thread fully Because in the book, they actually talk about leopard men. And I do wonder if the cheetah storyline of going into the deep, dark continent, finding this tribe, and ultimately undergoing this ritualistic ceremony, if it isn't tied, perhaps, to this leopard man story that's discussed in the book. So basically what it talks about... We've been looking at this mostly from a uh, Western European and Christian perspective, but let's take a look at a few other cultures. So one of the most popular and best known ideas is that of the leopard men of Africa who could allegedly transform themselves into large and feral cats. Indeed, this was said to form the basis of the African cult, which was viewed in the same way that many Christian Westerners might view voodoo in the Caribbean. The cult was said to have had supernatural powers and can transform themselves into the form of animals at meetings not terribly far removed in the popular imagination from the witch's sabbat of Western Europe in order to do great wickedness both to neighbors and to settlers. In antiquity, the leopard was a venerated animal suggesting strength, swiftness, knowledge, and alertness. And in Egypt, for example, it was used by certain pharaohs to symbolize their power and bravery in the face of their enemies, implying that some of the animal's supposed characteristics had somehow transferred themselves into the monarch. In Africa, certain cults that flourished in the West, such as Sierra Leone and the Ivory Coast, Guinea, and Nigeria, were believed to carry this veneration, but supposedly mixing it with other elements such as cannibalism and human sacrifice. Some of their victims, it was claimed, were young women who were sexually abused before being murdered. It is possible that the leopard men may well have started out as a warrior cult among some of the tribes of West Africa. Similarly to the berserkers in Scandinavia, young men may have been possessed by the leopard spirit in order to enable them to hunt with greater success or to oversee the social rites of passage 
message for young men. It may have developed into an almost clandestine society with wider supernatural implications. Shrines at which the cult assembled were erected to leopard gods deep in the forests, and their locations were only known to trusted cult members. The cult grouping was reputedly led by an individual known as the Bateyale, who was the human embodiment of the leopard. He was dressed in a leopard skin and a leopard mask, sometimes with long bone or metal claws, which he usually adopted the mannerisms and behaviors of the animal to keep and to lead his followers. In some cases, certain devotees of the cult would also don leopard leopard skins and behave very much like leopards, claiming that they were possessed by the leopard spirit. It is also of note that the members of such cults were all male, and this has led to the assumptions that it was in fact initially an exclusive warrior cult or even a passage cult. The leopard cult also functioned to some extent as a protector of the local community in which it flourished and sometimes was perceived as a possible conduit between men and the gods. If, for example, the crops failed, it was assumed that the gods were displeased in some way and that the leopard cult might choose an individual from the local community to be sacrificed in order to assuage their anger. In this way, the crops flourished again and the community was saved from starvation. The West actually discovers this in 1918, and of course, ultimately, this becomes an issue. So there is a point in which uh, they are finding people who are being murdered. They do find out about the leopard cult. And essentially, I guess in, in the, according to the record, in the mindset of the African people, the leopard men were very powerful almost mystical beings who could not be hurt. Well, indeed, one of the colonial policemen, of course, shot one of them. And as soon as that happened and he died and this leopard man died, the cult began to decline. But I do find it to be rather interesting just to kind of study that. And as I said, I'd be curious to see if that connects to the comic books, which oftentimes do pull from mythology. I think that's why I enjoy them as much as I do. We would have Black Panther, for example. I'm pretty sure there's a couple other characters that might fit in with that. Even maybe Wolverine, to a certain extent. He has the claws, and of course he used to have the Berserker Rages. That were actually called Berserker Rages. Okay, how about, interestingly, how did the werewolf become associated with full moons? And the book actually does talk a little bit about that. And I think that, again, he does a beautiful job with this. So let's go ahead and share. Okay, so starting in the Middle Ages, essentially, people did start looking at werewolves. They took it seriously, as well as witches and ghosts. And starting with the Enlightenment in the 17th to 18th centuries, of course, there is a lot of debunking of these sorts of superstitions. So Reginald Scott, which in my research on Shakespeare, we know that Shakespeare Shakespeare read him, definitely had an influence on the perception of the supernatural world. Scott, for example, said that people who saw ghosts were probably drunk, they were liars, they liked ghost stories, but he was very much against ghosts as actual phenomenon. They were not empirical, for one, and for two, of course, we also have the Reformation, and ghosts were associated with Catholicism because of purgatory. So this becomes a a really big mixed bag for this gentleman. But as time goes on, they're starting to kind of question how this notion of the full moon might impact the werewolf story. So the moon, of course, has a long association with mental stability. Indeed, our own words lunacy and lunatic, denoting mental illness or deterioration, have their roots in la lune, or la lune, the French word for the moon, originating from the name of the Roman goddess Luna. But where did this association begin? The Greeks took a scientific notion of both the human body and illness, and as the Roman Galen would do later on, divided it up into various humors such as phlegm, blood, and bile, each specific to certain bodily parts. The exact balance of these allowed the body itself to function in a normal state and ensured good health. If these went out of kilter, then the illness resulted. For instance, too much blood in the body would engender fever. And I have told students in my lectures that in the Middle Ages, they believed if you went bald, it was literally because you were too hot, that you had perhaps too much blood. Men tended to be warm and dry. And so heat basically burned off your hair. Kind of interesting. The brain, it was believed, contained large amounts of moisture, the balance of which would be essential to its proper function. This allowed a civilized and rational train of thought to remain in ascendancy while other dark impulses were kept restrained 
However, as with other bodily parts, the integral workings of the body might also be influenced by some outside agency. Noting the way in which the weak gravitational pull of the moon affected the tides of oceans, Greek philosophers assumed that it had a similar effect upon the moisture that the brain contained, and it might throw the delicate humor balance out of line and allow more savage and unwholesome lusts to come to the fore. The civilized man might be gradually transformed by the pull of the moon into a raging, irrational creature, literally a lunatic. Many Greek thinkers, such as Aristotle and Hippocrates, uh, recounted it as a fact. Indeed, so strong was the association that the Greek goddess Selene, or Selene, one representation of the triple moon goddess, was identified with wild unprecedented behavior and was sometimes depicted as dancing through the woodlands in an unrestrained and bizarre manner. So I think this is kind of an interesting thing because number one, I actually didn't realize that's where lunacy came from. I do know that there is no scientific basis as far as I can tell for the moon to impact a person. But here we are with the werewolf legend and now we kind of understand why. So during the full moon, the moon pulls on our moist brains just like the ocean and creates an imbalance. So the next time somebody tells you it's a full moon and everybody goes crazy, you can actually say, well, (laughs) that's based on faulty science. I do find it interesting, however, because I will joke with folks that I know when a full moon is coming. And in fact, we just had one about three days ago, in part because the pugs go crazy. They tend to behave even worse than normal. And if you are not aware, pugs have two settings and it is usually asleep or naughty. So there you go. But uh, we'll kind of continue on with some of these thoughts uh, right after these messages and kind of conclude what we've got going on in this particular four-part series. We'll be right back. Now, time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Radio.com, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back. So we're talking a little bit about some of the folklore that's out there, and I thought you might find this kind of interesting. For example, we just talked about the humors, and I'm sure you're going, well, this is a Paranormal Pets thing. Why are you talking about humors and the imbalances? Well, because again, the full moon creating these humoral imbalances is going to become important because the werewolf legends really start to take off in Western Europe in particular by the Middle Ages. And in fact, there's kind of a werewolf hysteria that takes place in France. They've got a couple of some very, very brutal, brutal stories that were really recorded and kind of became the stuff of tabloids. This one gentleman was kind of slow-witted, if you will, and not well-liked. He was accused of being a werewolf because there was a killer wolf in the area and the people saw it and they they thought it had features that were similar to this particular gentleman. And unfortunately, he was put on trial after being tortured. And if you do not know how they torture you in the Middle Ages, you don't want to know. I mean, it, it was pretty, pretty brutal. And ultimately, he's condemned to death and the way they kill him is just awful. But it was all recorded and kind of handed out. I mean, this was kind of the lurid details, kind of like, kind of like Jeffrey Dahmer. People become so fascinated with serial killers. So I I do find it interesting. 
Well, it does lead to a couple of interesting stories. So if you ever happen upon a werewolf, let's see if this helps you out. It turns out that sometimes the best way, according to some legends, to stop a werewolf is just to cut it. So these come from Sicily, but they're kind of fun. So the story is, here we go. Curiously, in old Sicilian folklore, the only way to cure a werewolf is to bleed it. So again, this goes back to the humors, which is why I was kind of talking about that. When the humors are imbalanced, they're imbalanced, they're out of whack. For example, if you do have a fever, they would put leeches on you or they would attempt to cut and bleed you. And in fact, we do know that uh, in the ancient world, one cure for werewolfism, because it was recorded, it was considered a, a form of melancholy that was caused by too much of a humor. I think it was bile in the body. So literally what they would do is they would cut open your vein and bleed out about 10% of your blood, which immediately did settle people down. I mean, it did stop the depression, the melancholy and the behavior. But of course, you know, they're bleeding you out pretty much. But ultimately, Sicily has a similar idea that the way you stop a werewolf is to bleed it out, to get rid of this imbalance of the humors. So there was a wealthy nobleman living in Sicily who was afflicted by the full moon. When it rose, he was supernaturally transformed into a ravening wolf, and yielding to his lupine cravings for flesh, he trusted only one servant with his secret. And so when he transformed, the man took him to the piazza and let him loose. I'm trying to figure what kind of gentleman is this, but I mean, at least in modern TV shows, we try to lock them up rather than let them loose, but okay. One night when he was wandering through the city, he encountered a soldier who was not afraid of him. He boldly faced the wolf and drawing his sword, slashed it across the face with the blade, cutting his forehead. Black, sticky blood spurted out, and it was only a small amount, for the sword blow had only been a glancing one, but it was enough to lift the werewolf curse. The creature fell, whining and crying at the soldier's feet, gradually changing back into its human form. The nobleman was incredibly happy and actually rewarded the soldier for releasing him from the terrible werewolf curse that had blighted him for so long. We actually find two other stories that are quite similar. The second one comes from a religious woman in Palermo. Some believe that she was the sister of a priest and the sister of clergy were often said to have special powers in many Catholic countries. Although she regularly attended mass and fastidiously observed her prayers and devotions, these were not enough one night as she looked out from her windowsill and saw crouching a wolf-like creature. Uh, It was man-like, but it was covered in fur and had the snarling muzzle and gaping jaws of a wolf. Seeing her looking out, it emitted a roar and began to climb up to her balcony. And what I love is that she prays multiple times and it doesn't stop the werewolf. Finally, I mean, it keeps getting closer and closer. And I I have to admit, I mean, it plays out very much like a horror movie. And finally, the werewolf reaches her balcony and begins to climb into her room. She flees back into her room and she grabs a lightweight dagger and turned to face it. Issuing further prayers, she rammed the weapon at the advancing creature, catching it once again on the forehead. This thick black tarry blood welled up and groaning, the werewolf turned and fled. And now we actually say that there's a couple of different endings. In one, it was the woman's neighbor, whereas the other was a local prince. And the story about the local prince being, who was afflicted by the full moon means that, of course, she got heavily rewarded for her piety. So I think that was kind of interesting. The third story is from Ilba, Ibla, ooh boy, sorry, and it concerns a priest who also confronted a werewolf. And this story is kind of interesting because essentially what happens is a werewolf actually comes into the church, which you also wouldn't think about because normally creatures that are associated with darkness are going to be banned from churches. Ultimately, not only does this creature get into the church, but he approaches the priest. And the priest, of course, is praying his heart out, backing slowly towards the altar, and nothing stops this werewolf. The the prayers alone are not enough. The priest actually grabs the cross and holds it before him. But once again, this is not a vampire and the cross does nothing. So out of uh, a final defense, I guess the werewolf lunges at the priest and he swings the cross in front of him and the cross nicks the werewolf, I think on the forearm. Let me see if it's the forearm or the forehead. Forearm this time. Black sticky blood oozed forth and the werewolf yelped and fled. 
Before it reached the main door, it had begun to change. Eventually, it collapsed on the steps of the church, and when the priest ran to offer help, he found himself staring into the face of a fellow cleric whom he knew. Haltingly, the man told his story. He had been afflicted since childhood by the baleful rays of the moon, which transformed him into a savage beast. In that form, he had prowled the old town, attacking and sometimes killing those whom he met. It was only the shedding of blood when struck by a blow from the heavy cross that had released him from the curse. In other versions of the same story, it was a prominent benefactor to the church who was revealed as the werewolf, although his name was never disclosed. Once again, it was the rays of the full moon that caused the madness. So it is kind of interesting that you have to deal with werewolves a little bit differently than you do vampires and other such creatures. Oh, this is fun. This is kind of a reversal of a paranormal pet story. What do you do when a baby is abandoned or taken in by an animal and raised by an animal? So there's a couple of little stories here. In Persia, the great warrior leader Zhao was carried off as an infant by a giant bird, which took the child as prey, but ended up nurturing it. In the 7th century China, the wise and cunning Xu On, the governor of one of the provinces, was allegedly abandoned by his mother, the daughter of the prince of Ilun, but was subsequently raised by a tigress brought into the imperial palace. And in fact, the tigress raised this child, which I always find interesting, like Romulus and Remus, which we talked about in another episode. And indeed, he grew up to be a wise and powerful man, though he was prone to fits of temper, which he blamed upon his tigress heritage, which is kind of neat. All right, and we'll do one more. How about a saint? All right, the imagery of the feral child continued even into Christian tradition, with several notable saints being associated with the idea. St. Albius was allegedly abandoned as a baby in the wild by his mother who had given birth to him unlawfully, possibly through incest. A she-wolf foraging for food discovered the infant and reared him as her own until he was discovered by a shepherd who sold him to some Britons. He would later accept Christianity, founding a number of churches and monasteries, including one in the Aran Islands where St. Edna was abbot and eventually traveled to Rome. A great number of miracles are attributed to him, including several concerning animals, and he is supposedly the saint who baptized St. David of Wales. During medieval times, he was widely regarded as the patron saint of Munster. It is also said that at one point, the she-wolf who had suckled him came to seek his protection from some nobles who were hunting him. Now, just as an aside, apparently there were annual wolf hunts in this particular region, uh, which kind of makes it interesting that the foster mother that he had came to him for protection, and indeed he did grant her asylum. He protected her from being hunted and saved her from the kingsman. And every year thereafter, the wolf would come back to visit him, sometimes even bringing her new cubs, which I thought was kind of sweet. So, uh, kind of a fun thing. Also in Irish Christian mythology, the father of the Irish St. Barr was supposedly reared by wolves following his abandonment by his mother after an incestuous birth. In France, the 5th century St. Murdoch or Medoc, was reputedly raised by a hunting she-wolf who carried him away from his cradle and into the wild. She may have intended to devour him, but ended up raising him as her own. However, it is said, even in mature years and long after his return to civilization, the saint displayed a number of lupine characteristics, which hinted at his life in the wild. So I think those are some, you know, pretty good werewolf stories, saintly wolves, non-Christian wolves, you name it, and they are out there. So at this point, we are going to pause, and when we get back, we will actually have our little paranormal investigation incident that hopefully you guys will enjoy. We'll be right back. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. 
There is a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> And welcome back. Here is our segment on a recent case. All right. And this time we have Marina of the Spirits of St. Petersburg, who on another episode shared her paranormal puppy story with us. And she actually uh, has another story that we're going to talk about just to set up the premise. There was an afternoon where I was called at 2.30 by a person about a house that was to be demolished the next day. This house basically had belonged, it was from the 1930s, had belonged to one family. The homeowner had passed away, and this group of people had permission to go through the house and and see what they could retrieve and what they could save of the homeowner's legacy. So I actually put out a call to the spirits, and God bless them, man, they were ready. We actually got a small group together, and we were there at 8.30 at night until about 11.30 at night doing this investigation. And of course, the house was not really in the best of shape. You know, Marina will tell you as well, but we were climbing over items, and, you know, it kind of been very ransacked, and parts of it left open to the elements. And so it was a cold night in Florida. It was 47 degrees, and so we're all wearing our jackets. <laughs> we're trying to get through this house to see if if anyone was still in there because the ladies who contacted us and who gave us permission to be there felt like they had some contact from the prior homeowner and they they kind of wanted to see if we could get any more contact from her before her house had been destroyed. So at the end of this particular investigation, as we're preparing to wrap up, and I actually have a little clip that I will uh, insert here, we actually had a rather unique phenomenon. So as you listen to this, you'll hear us actually talking about how these ladies saw a cat on the property, and then by golly, some cats appear. So Marina, (laughs) you were there with two other investigators and and our contact. What did you think of this whole thing? Those cats, man, I tell you, they scared the hell out of me. Um, no, we're, we are. We, we're sitting there. We're wrapping up. We just, you know, been through this three-hour investigation and, yeah, climbing over everything. And one of the other investigators and I, first of all, we thought we had seen something on the stairs. So we're both kind of, like, looking at the stairs. And I don't remember whether it was me or her. One of us turned off her flashlight, and there's a cat on the stairs. A gray and white cat just mm-hmm. kind of walking by. Where, where did that cat come from? Because we, we hadn't heard it. We hadn't seen it. We So we were just talking about that when all of a sudden something comes running by us and we scream. It was another cat. It wasn't a gray and white cat. It was yet another cat. And the, the weird thing. Yeah, there would be two cats together. And the weirdest thing is that the cat showed up while I was talking with our contact about how she had seen this orange and white cat, right? And that's the cat that came running by, scaring the heck out of us because we had just seen the other one up on the stairs. (laughs) Who knows where this one came from? I have to say that was a fir- one of the first for the spirits. I, you know, I, I keep saying that that was one of the most ghost hunterly things that I have done in years to go through a house pre demolition, even with permission, etc. But uh, you know, to actually have that whole experience and then at the end to. I think uh, it was, what, 11.30, and we were all getting really tired. I mean, the house was kind of mildewy and cold, and I think we yeah. all woke up after that. <laughs> so. I definitely did. I, I That cat scared the heck out of me. I have no idea where it came from. I just saw it running right by my leg. <laughs> And the good news is that when we did talk to our contact afterwards, I guess they took the house down in sections, but the cats had already left. They they had gotten out. But I just thought that was hysterical. So part of the reason we like to include this is that it was an animal interaction on a paranormal investigation, just not a typical one. Uh, Instead of uh, an animal ghost, it was the actual animal. And instead of us sensing it, they sensed us. (laughs) Definitely. 
definitely sensed us and scared us. <laughs> so that was fun. Well, I thank you so much for doing two of these, and we will wrap up this episode and see where it goes next time. All right. <laughs> All right, take care. All right, folks, I think that's it for this very long episode of Paranormal Pets, but I am going to encourage you once again, if you'd like to learn more about the supernatural in St. Petersburg, check out the Spirits of St. Petersburg site at www.spiritsofstpete.com. And remember to adopt or support rescues. There are plenty of animals out there that are in need of a good home. I thank you, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Paranormal Pets. Happy haunting and take care. Pet Life Radio presents Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Step into the supernatural world of pets every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.